it's a real pleasure to have um, Ambassador Mora here today to speak about the United States, the OAS, and the Inter-American system. Let me give you a brief introduction to uh, Ambassador Mora. He is currently, as I mentioned, the um, ambassador representing the United States in the Organization of American States. Prior to joining the OAS, and by the way, he was confirmed December 30th of this past year, so he's just new to the job and uh, has just started his, his role at the OAS. And he's got, I think, a lot of work on his hands given the current state of, of geopolitics globally as well as the current state of affairs in Latin America. Uh, prior to joining um, the OAS, uh, Ambassador Mora was a professor and senior research uh, scholar at uh, Florida in um, International University in Miami. And he also was the director of the Green Latin American and Caribbean Center at the university. Before joining F um, FIU, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere from 2009 to 2013. And then before that, he had served as a consultant for the Library of Congress, for the State Department, for the OAS, and U.S. Southern Command. He's also uh, written and uh, co-edited five books, including one entitled Neighborly Adversaries, the U.S.-Latin American Relations. And he is a graduate of um, the University of Miami, where he got his Ph.D., and he also got his B.A. from George, uh, George Washington University. So with that, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to the, to the podium Ambassador Mora, who uh, will provide some perspective on where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the OAS and the American system. Welcome to San Diego and welcome to the Institute. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Richard. And, and it's good to be here. It's good to see some old faces, not by age, I'm sorry, but by time, by the period I've, I've, I've known Rafa and everybody. It's good to see you all and to meet new, new people. Uh, Richard is right. I, I, was, um, I was actually confirmed on December 14th. I was sworn in on December 30th, so it's been a couple of months or so, right? Uh, after uh, the confirmation process lasted, in my case, about 16 and a half months. So uh, during that uh, time, I wasn't able to work, um, of course, at the OAS or do anything at the State Department. But needless to say, I had a lot of time to think about what I wanted to do with the Organization of American States. And that's what we're trying to do. And I'll lay out some, not all, or at least few of the priorities that, that I, uh, that I want to lay out. And one of them is exactly something that Richard talked about, which is the state of democracy in the region the erosion or backsliding of the rule of law, of human rights, of democracy overall that we're seeing in the region and how it's impacting what we do at the OAS and, and the priorities that we've uh, laid out. So again, thank you again for uh, the opportunity to really speak. This is the first time that I speak in public outside of the OAS, uh, in public to, to talk a little bit about my, my priorities or the priorities of, of of the administration. So at the core of, I think, my remarks is exactly to, is the issue of democracy and human rights. Um, not because of what's going on in the region, but in my mind, it is at the core of what the organization can, uh, can do and does well, right? Uh, it is, as you know, the issue of democracy is enshrined in the OAS Charter, a number of conventions that we've agreed to or signed, and of course, not too long ago, the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, and my view is at the moment that the Inter-American Democratic Charter is, there's a certain indifference about the charter. Uh, it's not that people don't support it, don't embrace it, but the commitment, I think, of many states to the charter, and therefore to, I think, democracy, is something that is uh, concerning to us. And so, you know, as Secretary Blinken said um, when he was uh, in Ecuador uh, in October of, uh, of 2021, and I'll read this because I think it's at the core of the challenge that we're facing. He said, the common thread that runs through every part of U.S. policy, domestic and foreign, is, to need, is the need to make democracy work for all people. Uh, the view, uh, I think, guides our approach to the region 
and to the inter-American system, to the organization of American states. It also reflects the reality uh, uh, that the OS is the only regional forum that brings together all democratically elected governments of the Americas and allows for um, an inclusive dialogue and diplomacy to carry uh, the day. No other organization, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, uh, including CELAC, has that commitment to democracy and to human rights. At the Ninth Summit uh, the, of the Americas, held not, not too far from here in June of last year, leaders came together uh, to reaffirm our shared goals, commitment to expanding racial, ethnic, uh, social inclusion, and economic opportunity for all the people in the hemisphere, ensuring safety uh, for our citizens, securing clean sources of energy, and building effective institutions of democratic governance and accountability. And I will get to the issue of accountability in a little bit. Priority U.S. initiatives to address these concerns, as you may have heard, include uh, the America's Partnership for uh, Economic Prosperity, the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration, and the American Health Corps, and the Caribbean Partnership to Address the Climate Change. Now, to advance these efforts, we look uh, forward to hosting uh, the City uh, Summit, which will be held in Denver here at the end of April. We were just talking about that and how cities and municipalities can contribute to the issues of governance, the challenges of governance at the local level. Uh, I'll be meeting with the mayor of Los Angeles here later this week to deepen that cooperation between uh, the city of Los Angeles and the OAS in advancing the priorities for the summit that I just mentioned. And I know the Institute of the Americas is going to be engaged in that, and so that is, I think, a positive thing. And thank you so much, Richard, for, for taking leadership on that. Yet despite these um, advances, we know there is um, a growing impatience uh, for tangible progress in the region. Democracy is simply for many people, at least they feel, is not giving them the goods. It's not delivering. And it's creating level, high levels of dissatisfaction and frustration that we're seeing manifested in a number of countries throughout the region. So this dissatisfaction with corruption or um, inequality and poverty have fueled a sort of strong reaction against governments, against incumbent governments. Uh, you'll notice that in more than 16, I think it might be 17 elections now, opposition leaders have won against incumbents. There is a constant anti-incumbent sort of feeling uh, uh, in, in, in these countries. And anti-incumbent, not, not just for the next election, oftentimes just after a year that a new government has come into office, which is challenging. So combined with political polarization across the Americas, this wave impacts our cooperation bilaterally and at the OES. The OES has often been a reflection of what is going on in the region. So if there is division and fragmentation, you will see that division and fragmentation at the OES. And we're seeing much of that. Uh, the 1990s, was the heyday of the inter-American system, as far as I'm concerned, right, Richard? Uh, it was the moment of a convergence of interests, a convergence on a commitment to democracy. A number of resolutions at the OAS were passed that ultimately culminated in the inter-American uh, democratic uh, charter. There was also talk of integration and free trade and e certain economic policies, and so, you know, uh, my predecessors who worked at the OAS, I often said, boy, what a great time to be the OAS ambassador. I'm not saying I don't enjoy my job, I love my job, <laughs> but the challenges are different because those of the region, uh, I think, uh, reflect that. So how do we promote, how do we get to meaningful cooperation or shared interest in the region? That is the challenge. So let me talk a little bit about the role of the OS in the region. As many as you know, recent events in the hemisphere from Venezuela to Nicaragua, Peru, Haiti, Brazil, 
have placed the OS front and center on the world stage over the past year. As the oldest multilateral institution in the world and as the premier multilateral institution in the Americas, many have looked to the OAS to find solutions to ongoing political impasses, while others in the region question its viability and capacity to address these threats. For our part, the U.S. is working to ensure that the, dem that the organization encounters democratic backsliding by following through on collective commitments to make government serve every citizen better so that all people of all walks of life have the tools to improve the quality of life. In my first speech at the OAS, uh, at the Permanent Council, I raised two points. One, that the United States was going to recommit itself to this organization to ensure that it, became, it, 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 it continues to be a relevant institution. And I cited in, um, in that speech John F. Kennedy. When he came to the organization in April of 1961, and he gave a speech where he sort of laid out his vision for Latin America. And one of the things he said was, that this organization is the only thing we have. It's the thing that we need to nurture. And that any talk of alternatives, he used the word alternative solutions, would undermine, and he went on to talk about what was then known as the Western Hemisphere idea, Pan-Americanism, et cetera, right? And I quoted, right, I used that language in my speech to remind my colleagues that this organization is vital if we're going to solve or address the challenges uh, that we have. And not just democratic backsliding or violations of human rights, but the issues of energy and climate change and even migration and issues of multidimensional uh, security. Um, I've said that and I continue to say that at the Permanent Council and to the media whenever I have a chance. So in keeping with the core mission of the, OAS, of the OAS, the U.S. has been very clear to emphasize uh, the effective implementation of the Inter-American Democratic Charter adopted on that fateful day of September 11, 2001 in Lima, Peru, right? Uh, that is, as far as we are concerned, that is the charter that we are recommitting the organization to. We are going to have meetings uh, before the General Assembly. We're going to be talking about the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And this, at this point in time, is the, it is the most important, I think, document that we can talk about and that we will be pushing forward to. And not allowing others, won't say what member states, uh, allow to ignore or to set aside that organization, that, that important document, right? And so we're going to commit ourselves to doing that. Uh, at the last General Assembly um, in, in Lima, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, said, and, and he said it in ways that I think capture what we're trying to do. He said, we have to recommit to delivering on the core principles of our, our OAS and the Inter-American Democratic Charter. He laid, right, the stone down. He said, we're going to fight for this document at this particular time. Because, as you all know, responsive governance is critical for ensuring that our efforts, and by effort, our efforts, I mean the, the region, in terms of both policy and programming, are rooted in accountability and transparency. At the same time, for the U.S. to be resourced appropriately, we continue to make the case for the modernization uh, of the organization's operations. The OES at this time is in a budgetary crisis, right? Just to give you a number, in 1983, 40 years ago, the organization, after a restructuring of the organization, right, uh, which saw its personnel cut by 34%, under the Secretary Generalship of uh, Alejandro Fila, uh, had a, thou a little over a thousand people working in the Secretariat in 1983 with a budget of $94 million in 1983 dollar numbers, right? Today, we have a Secretariat with about 325, 330 people 
with a budget in today's dollars of $83 million. That is not sustainable, right? We have to make the argument as to the relevance, the strategic relevance, what's the value proposition of this organization, and, is, and are we, we members, are going to commit ourselves to this organization or are we just going to let it wither? We are not going to let it wither. We will commit ourselves to that. Now let me talk a little bit about U.S. leadership on democracy and human rights. And I'm really just touching the surface here because I want to make sure we have time for question and answer, but I do want to just raise the key themes. Now deepening respect, as I said, for democratic governance, human rights, the fundamental freedoms is, uh, as I said, a top priority for the United States and the Biden-Harris administration. We especially value and commit ourselves to the work of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights as it highlights ongoing uh, threats uh, to human rights in the region and holds all OAS member states, including the United States, to account. I'm here in Southern California in advance of the Commission's period of human rights hearings that are going to be held in UCLA, and that's where I'll be going uh, uh, tomorrow. And the United States has actually been called to a hearing on our Haitian migration policy, and I will be there to participate. The Commission also to undertook a site visit to assess the state of homelessness in Los Angeles uh, last week, as well as a study tour of Silicon Valley focused on freedom of expression online. So these engagements with the Commission are, I think, a clear reflection of the U.S. commitment to dialogue and urgent human rights concerns. This also underscores the fact that recognizing human rights at home at home is a critical part of President Biden's foreign policy vision because we can't be credible advocates for democracy and human rights abroad if we are not demonstrating our com commitment to these principles here at home. We're not perfect, far from it, but we're always striving to live, live up to our high to highest ideals and principles. Because when citizens of the region see that the United States or the citizens in the, here in the United States can freely speak, uh, peacefully protest, that we can criticize our political leaders, that members of our free press can work without fear or interference, that citizens can petition the Inter-American Commission, and that we care for the most marginalized, they, other member states, respond to our actions or inactions. The United States is proud to play a role in advancing human rights and fundamental freedoms in the Americas. Our commitment to human rights and democracy, of course, is in our founding documents. And we are the most important funder of the Commission. We fund 50% of the Commission's work. By the way, we fund 50% of the organization as well. Um, so we're constantly looking for ways to empower, defend, lift up human rights defenders in all their forms and to counter repressive tactics against citizens, dissidents, academics, journalists, and others targeted by authoritarian regimes, regardless of their political or ideological inklings. There's a great word right, that we say in Spanish, hay que ser consecuente with human rights. We have to be consistent with how we think about human rights and not selective because one country or one government might be a little friendlier to us than others. This is why, uh, as I said, we support the Human Rights the, um, the Commission, uh, the Office of the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, we support, and of course the new Center for Media Integrity of the Americas launched in the margins of the LA Summit. Uh, the center, this particular center, which is, uh, uh, its director is a former Foreign Service officer, former ambassador, to, um, to Panama, John, John Feely, which some of you may know, um, is, is, is the, the center is serving as a hub to recognize uh, and to deal with issues like disinformation, social media information, and all the other challenges that we face. Uh, building on these efforts to promote democracy and inclusion, the United States will be also co-hosting at the end of this month the second summit of democracy, right? along with Costa Rica, the Netherlands, South Korea, uh, and Zambia, where we will demonstrate, or at least democracies will demonstrate, that they can indeed <coughs> deliver and demonstrate what they have done since the last uh, summit held virtually 
uh, a year and a half ago. Now let me briefly go through the region and just sort of highlight some of um, our policy and how the inter-American system is, is, is addressing this. And of course, let me start with Haiti, which I know is of special interest here in Southern California due to the challenge faced by Haitian migrants and local service providers at the U.S. southern border. Now, uh, the Haitian people uh, must identify uh, a path uh, to achieve an inclusive, broad-based uh, consensus on the way forward for their country's governance and, and development. Uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Henri, along with key private sector actors, as well as other political and social forces, must put aside their differences and forge a path forward toward improved security, elections, and economic growth. The international community is vital. It has a responsibility to support and help but those who impede this process and put their own narrow interest ahead in Haiti of the welfare of the Haitian people will continue to face the possibility of sanctions and visa restrictions, and not just from the United States, but as you've seen from the United Nations, Canada, and others. We continue to do everything to combat the humanitarian, the health, the economic, and security crisis in Haiti today. We are committed to working with our international partners, including through a new OAS working group on Haiti to develop a framework for the deployment of a multinational police force to deal or address the issue of security in that country. I can certainly go into more about Haiti, so I welcome your comments on that. Let me talk about Venezuela. Um, we are still very much committed to democracy and to human rights and to standing with the people of Venezuela during this challenging moment. We join the international community, including the OAS, in welcoming the resumption of negotiations between the opposition and the Maduro regime. Uh, and we will join and we will do everything within our ability to help the Venezuelan people move toward the restoration of democracy. The people of Venezuela should be allowed to exercise their right to choose their leaders and move on from corruption, repression, authoritarianism. At the same time, we will continue to support efforts at the OAS to ensure that Maduro regime is held accountable for atrocities committed against Venezuelans. Our sanctions policy remains unchanged. We have long made clear our willingness to review our sanctions posture based on concrete steps towards democratic solution in Venezuela or to reimpose sanctions should the Maduro regime fail to th follow through on its commitment. As you know, uh, the Maduro regime decided to withdraw, to renounce the OAS charter. Uh, so they do, currently do not, uh, their seat is vacant uh, and they have apparently no interest in returning to to, to the OAS, to the Inter-American System, because of the work that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights did in shining a light on the abuses being committed by that regime. Which leads me to Nicaragua, which the Nicaraguan government has also renounced the charter and has decided to leave as well the OAS, and that will happen or become official in November of this year, unless it doesn't withdraw, uh, this withdraw its, its decision to, to get out. Now the situation in Nicaragua uh, remains, as you know, serious for the inter-American community. Uh, I have been pleased to see how member states in sort of overwhelming numbers have decided to, to be honest and critical of that dictatorship. Um, a number of important resolutions have, been, have passed prior to my arrival. What that ultimately led to uh, the isolation, the self-isolation, but diplomatic isolation of the Nicaraguan regime. Uh, you may have heard that the United States not too long ago welcomed the recent release of 222 political prisoners. There are at least 200 other uh, political prisoners still uh, in uh, Nicaraguan jails, uh, and many of them have been languishing there for years now. Um, it was extremely, for me, personally, moving to meet uh, with a few of the recently released prisoners 
to hear their stories of the hardship and how they were treated in jail, in detention, and their resolve remains, I think, unwavering. Uh, but while the United States believed the decision uh, of the Nicaraguan government was a positive one, uh, actions taken, decisions taken by Managua since the release of political prisoners, including lifting or denying the citizenship, which is a violation of the Universal Declaration, I think does not, um, does not indicate that things will get better in terms of human rights and the rule of law there. Uh, and we, were, we have never wavered in our support and will not waver in our support for the Nicaraguan people. Um, one, as I said, there's a number of other uh, dissidents and political prisoners. We are mostly concerned with the bishop, uh, Rolando Alvarez, uh, who has been sentenced to 26 years in jail uh, for simply uh, expressing uh, opinions. Uh, Cuba. Uh, everyone is always interested in talking about Cuba. Uh, as a proud Cuban American, uh, I would be remiss if I did not really underscore or make mention of the st appalling situation in Cuba, particularly since July of 2021, after those protests that led to a brutal repression of, of uh, protesters, citizens, uh, including minors. Um, and unfortunately, we continue to see uh, citizens harassed, arrested, abused um, by, by the government. Uh, and so we don't see independent, many independent voices, journalists, et cetera. Uh, the United States continues to urge the OAS and its member states to stand behind the Cuban people by supporting uh, their rights to freedom of expression. Um, La and we're doing everything in support of the Cuban uh, people. As you may know, we removed caps on remittances. We've allowed families to support each other uh, through travel and other means, and we will continue to do so. Uh, the regional migration, I think, is also an issue that I think many of you um, are concerned about, know about. Uh, there is, as you know, ongoing challenges to irregular migration and displacement. And the United States continues to underscore our shared responsibility to achieve a safe, orderly, regular, and humane migration management, as set forth in the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration. Uh, our co coordination with regional partners on humane migration management includes support for legal pathways, addressing root causes, uh, et cetera, and including uh, important efforts on the part of the administration to m mobilize private sector resources to deal with the issues or the roots of these of, of, of migration. Uh, Central America. Um, here again, uh, we're seeking in a very challenging environment to see how democracy can deliver in the face of real serious governance challenges in Guatemala, uh, in Honduras, and what we know as the Northern Triangle. Uh, as I mentioned, we continue to attract or try to attract foreign investments into the Northern uh, Triangle. Vice President Harris launched a call to action in Northern Central America uh, to the private sector to create economic opportunities. And we've seen so far about $4.2 billion have been galvanized for, for that effort. At the OS, we are active, uh, providing technical and development assistance. This is important work that the OS does in supporting confidence building measures in a number of areas. Uh, uh, not just on the issue of migration, but border issues uh, and uh, uh, electoral observations, which is to me the gold standard of, of, of electoral observation. Mexico and North America. Uh, as many of you know, the U.S.-Mexico relationship is one of the world's most important, dynamic, strategic, economically significant, and certainly a key priority here in Southern California. Uh, Presidents Biden and President López Obrador are committed to joining, sort of like building a more prosperous and secure future. We are working, uh, and I hope you've seen that in some of the summits, uh, together to strengthen supply chains and address issues of climate change and health crises and accelerate the energy, uh, clean energy transition which is uh, uh, particularly important for, for both countries, as well as expanding areas to uh, manufacture semiconductors. We are uh, intensifying efforts to confront the issue of illicit 
synthetic drugs and fentanyl we are aware, aware of, and working closely with Mexico at the OAS on hemispheric security and dealing with exactly with these issues of illicit trafficking, uh, hemispheric security, and even gender equity issues. There is still much work to do here uh, on the North American uh, space. Uh, it is a constant sort of effort to address these challenges which are significant but that we see as opportunities. Um, finally, let me sort of in conclusion sort of address some of the, one issue that Richard raised. Um, a capable, effective, and responsive OAS is indispensable. We cannot, the United States, cannot afford the weakening or God forbid, the disappearance of the OAS. There are some member states that I will not mention who, there are some member states that would like to see the organization weaken and replace with something else. Uh, I have referred to it as an existential threat. I don't use hyperbole, I do not exaggerate. But my, my sense after being two months is that we are facing a, a moment where we can no longer kick this can down the road. And in fact, I've been pleased to see other member states refer to this situation as not kicking this can down the road anymore, which is good, good to hear. There's an understanding that there is a problem, and that I think is the first thing. We are actually having a retreat later this month among member states of the Permanent Council to talk exactly about these issues. What is the value proposition? What is the relevance? What are the priorities? And how does that get reflected uh, in the budget? So, democracy, that's going to be, it's not the only priority, but that's going to be at the top of our shared uh, list of priorities that we're going to engage. So that is imperative that member states uh, work together to, uh, to, to identify shared strategic priorities that deal specifically with the issue of democracy, human rights, the environment, and the fiscal situation of the institution. Um, we are seeing in the region uh, efforts by democratically elected governments to undermine democracy. And as the Secretary said, the way you address the weakness of democracy is not with less democracy, but with more democracy. And through the OAS, through the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, through the electoral observation process through the Inter-American Democratic Charter, we will work towards that goal. Uh, I can testify from my own lengthy journey to be with you as U.S. Ambassador to the OAS that there's always a case for optimism. And I am optimistic about the OAS, notwithstanding the challenges and divisions that I mentioned, but there is a recognition that we cannot let this institution wither. And the United States is certainly committed to that effort. Thank you so much. We're going to take some questions. I'm going to lead off with a few um, to get things started. You spoke um, at the beginning about um, the, the perception in the region that uh, democracy hasn't delivered. Uh, we've seen with the free trade of the Americas, um, the first summit of the Americas, there was, a, there was a promise that uh, we'd be able to expand free trade agreements throughout the hemisphere. 9-11 happened and priorities shifted and, and we didn't deliver. Uh, today, um, we have CELOC as a sort of counter force to the OAS. China has attended the last three meetings since 2015. Um, the administration has recently put forward um, APEP, the America's Partnership for Economic Progress, is that enough? Um, do we need to be doing more in terms of opening up markets um, to deliver on the promise? Because while democracy is important, many of these countries are suffering from a lot of economic despair post-COVID, yeah. and there's a need for job creation and economic opportunity. So I'd like to get your comments on that. Sure, no, excellent, thank you so much. I think the key is uh, foreign investment, right? Um, you're right, the, the COVID, I think, um, expose the pre-existing conditions of the region. Uh, and so uh, we saw prior to COVID important progress on issues of inequality and poverty, for example, in many countries. 
Uh, after COVID, we've seen a backsliding on that. Uh, that has to do, as I think in part, has to do with um, economic opportunities and contractions in, in economic growth. We got to get back to economic growth. APEP is very focused on foreign investments and creating opportunities for those, especially those individuals most affected by COVID uh, and the challenges in the healthcare system and the educational system to, to come out of it. The argument of APEP is foreign investment. We, as you know, have foreign trade uh, agreements with many countries in the region. There's 11 countries within APEP. More countries can join. I think hopefully we'll do so in the near future. But also there is a problem of, you know, the structural challenges in the region, the issue of reform. Uh, those things need to happen in tax systems and other things. So, yes, I think uh, free trade and other things can be useful, but I think we shouldn't um, forget that uh, the same challenges that the Alliance for Progress had, which is there was all this money coming in, but there weren't the sort of reforms required to make or translate that, those, those resources into true development. We've, we still are, we, we still have that debt, I think, to, to, to address these issues, particularly in, in, in taxation in, in Central America, just to give you an example. Another, another question, then we'll, then we'll open up. Um, Maria, I'll do this again. Um, just, let me just have one other question related to Nicaragua. You spoke about Nicaragua's um, plans to withdraw from the OAS. And um, um, as you know, uh, Nicaragua is a signatory to CAFTA DR, Free Trade Agreement. NAF, sorry, uh, Nicaragua is benefiting tremendously from that agreement, um, both in terms of U.S. investment as well as exports to the United States. Um, given the fact that the preamble of CAFTA DR um, highlights the need for um, transparency, anti-corruption uh, in, tr in foreign investment uh, and trade, uh, what is the U.S. position related to uh, CAFTA DR and Nicaragua? Has, has some thinking um, been going on inside um, the current administration about revisiting uh, Nicaragua's participation in that agreement? So, uh, I, as I often as I often like to say, what we're going to what, what we we will not take measures that will affect or impact the Nicaraguan people directly, right? Uh, we have to think about you know if we take measures, are these targeted measures at the regime, or are these measures that can affect um, the the situation, the, the livelihood and standard of living in Nicaragua? So we want to avoid hurting the Nicaraguan people, uh, you know. There are, there are governments in the region that uh, would like us not to do that. Uh, there's been no decision on that issue that you have just raised. Um, I, I, I realize that there's a lot of question concerns that the United States might do that. Uh, but no decision has been made. Uh, in part has to do with we are working other, through other means, right? We're to, using other tools. To, to try to help the Nicaraguan people, to pr pressure on the, on the regime there. Uh, but we, we will, what we will not do is contribute to the impoverishment of the Nicaraguan people. Uh, let me repeat the question. Um, uh, the question had to do with the recent announcement by Tesla to invest uh, in a gigafactory in, outside of uh, Monterrey and Nuevo Leon. Um, the question was really, what, what impact will that have in terms of catalyzing greater investment and opportunity for um, Mexico and um, the northern border? Certainly. So that is exactly what APEP has in mind, right? Um, but not just in Mexico, of course, with a number of countries. Now, the conditions within these countries have to be, you know, uh, conducive to this. And I think uh, Tesla and other companies sort of made their assessment. So absolutely, I think... <coughs> The idea of innovation, uh, the idea of how foreign investments can directly affect individuals in terms of not just generating jobs but improving their, that, that, is, that is at the cornerstone, I think, of APEP um, uh, and of foreign investments. Uh, could they be done in other governments, in other countries? Um, I think so. I think there are some governments where and some other governments are not. Uh, because of these structural challenges that impede that kind of, that kind of investment and working. These, these are also small economies, remember, so those investments could be challenging. But there are other types of investments uh, along those lines, but not as sophisticated as that, that I think could be very helpful. But that's certainly the objective. Rafa Fernandez, director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, has a question. 
Thank you, Richard. Uh, Frank, uh, thank you for sharing, uh, for coming to San Diego and for sharing with us your, your, your thoughts. Uh, you gave us uh, a wonderful tour of the horizon of what's going on in our hemisphere. It, it, give, it gives me hope that someone as seasoned and, and experienced as you is the new ambassador of the U.S. Uh, to the OAS because we badly need you there and people like you there because, yes, uh, the institution is it's been, it's been in a crisis for the last, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years or so. And uh, thank you for being patient because uh, uh, it took you about 16 months to be <laughs> confirmed and, uh, and uh, I'm glad you were very patient. Uh, Frank, uh, you mentioned these two things, but I see a crisis coming in US-Mexican relations. Clearly with the fentanyl issue, uh, well, there's two members uh, in Congress, two Republicans that they basically call in uh, for naming the, the Mexican cartels as uh, terrorist organizations. And that could have devastating consequences for, for, for the hemisphere. So uh, I, I would say in the 90s, the OEA, the, OEA, the, the OEAs plays a very important role in easing the tensions between Latin America and the, and the US on the drug war. So I wonder if you could elaborate. On what, uh, what do you think that it, it could be done? And another thing, you also touch about, uh, I mean, you mentioned four countries, and uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela. And, and Mexico, yes, but, and Mexico, I would put it. And actually, during the last six months of last year, uh, the largest number of immigrants coming into the U.S.-Mexico border, they were coming for those five countries. <laughs> and, uh, and nowadays, uh, thanks to an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, now there's, I mean, the flow of Nicaraguans, Cubans, Haitians, and Venezuelans coming into the border decreased by 92% yes. in January. So it obviously is telling us that, yes, I mean, when you control the border, you have some uh, important consequences. But I, I will say that uh, that is an aspirin uh, to the cancer that we have in those four countries. So what, what is what the OAS could really do to, to solve the problem? And uh, I mean, what are you, your thoughts about it? Because I, I'm very worried that, I mean, this is uh, it's helping to ease the tensions in the, in the border, but then you uh, perhaps just exacerbating the problem in those countries because some of those citizens, they, they can no longer come to here and they have, uh, and let's face it, Frank, I mean, they need to go someplace else because they don't have the means to survive in the country. So uh, uh, sorry for this long question to you, but I know that you're a leader, you're, you're, you're someone with a lot of ideas. And, uh, and again, it gives me hope that someone like you and with your mission and commitment, you're uh, representing the, the US in this very important institution in the Americas. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. Just let me take their second question. So what, one element of why we've seen, I think, a decline um, from those uh, countries is because of the parole process that we have now. We have, um, oh, so we're, um, there's a parole process by which 30,000, every month, 30,000 citizens of those countries can apply, uh, and they have to do it through a, an app and so on and so forth. So we are allowing now, for example, 14,000 Haitians have taken advantage from that and have come to the United States through a, a legal, safe process. The same applies to Venezuelan, Cubans, uh, and Nicaraguans. And I think that has been part of the reason why we've seen a decline. But you're right. This is just to deal with the crisis on the border, uh, or part of the crisis on the border, I should say. But it's not the solution. It's not the long-term structural <coughs> solution. Yeah, uh, when people ask me that question, I'm often said, well, you know, what is it that we can do um, in Nicaragua or in Haiti or in Cuba to change the reasons why people migrate? We can, we can have a, we can have, we can make investments, we can attract foreign investments, we can have sort of $4 billion in assistance, we can be creative as to how we try to address the issue of migration. Climate change, for example, is another uh, driver. As you know, those aren't easy issues to address, and we can't do it from the United States, and frankly, the OAS by itself can't be uh, a significant uh, player in this. A lot of it has to do with what happens and what can be done 
by the people and the, and the governments in those countries, right? There's always an expectation that we can change outcomes in the region. We, we, really, we really can't. And that's the biggest challenge, right, of these authoritarian governments who have demonstrated complete disregard for their, for their people. Now, you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said, well, we, these people have to go somewhere. So what do we do? Do we tell them all to come to the United States? That, that's not plausible, right? That's not plausible, right? We have to find a way, a legal way to do this, and I think we, we're working on that. But we, th the answer can be, right, um, it creates challenge. So this is a complicated process. There is no easy solution. And you're right, I think the OS provides a platform or a venue for collaboration and cooperation that oftentimes is not or does not exist in bilateral relationships. But the challenge there is the resources that I explained to you, right? The sort of division that sometimes we have uh, that is, uh, you know, that is, is, is impeding, I think, the progress that we can make. Nevertheless, there are processes like the migration committees and others within the OAS that are doing, I think, good work, but can't be very impactful because it just doesn't have the bandwidth, the size to do it because we've been extracting resources. So let me go to your first question, which was more complicated. Um, yes, I, I think um, there are some in the United States uh, that are you know, raising these issues in ways that perhaps are not productive because includes using force, right? Uh, I, I don't, uh, Rafael, I don't, I don't think that's going to be the dominant view. Um, I think there's an understanding that we need to collaborate with the Mexican government. We are collaborating with the Mexican government on this issue. It's a priority for the United States. So those conversations are constant, right, constant. Uh, and, and the Mexican government has been, I think, uh, you know, responsive and wants to work with us as in the issue of, of, of migration, right? Um, but again, this is an issue that will require not just the U.S. and the Mexican government, I think it requires, you know, a lot of this, as you know, comes from China. So how do we deal with that issue, right? This, the, the issue of where the, the fentanyl is, is, is coming from. So um, to use your example, you, can the OAS be the platform to address these issues? It has, Rafael, the potential to do it. It's there. I think it has the tools, right? There's two things missing. One, political will, and two, the issue of resources. Right. If we can support the OAS, if we can empower the OAS to do what it was doing maybe 15, 20 years ago, I think it can play a larger role. It can be very productive in providing that platform and that vehicle where countries can really talk and think creatively, as we are about Haiti, for example, which I think we're making good progress on. But the issues are much more complicated outside of Haiti. And the OAS still hasn't, doesn't have the, the, the sort of the tools to do that in ways that we would hope and expect. We have a question from Irving Train. You want to come up? Having served for a number of years with, in the job you're in now as your deputy and having actually worked in the OAS for 15 years. One of the great problems I find is that we're looking for instant miracles, and there are no instant miracles. We're dealing with 34 countries at very different stages of development, politically and economically, and we try to set the agenda in Washington usually our agenda. And this has to be a two-way dialogue. And it has to be, in many ways, I think, a dialogue in which we recognize the, li the limitations of many of the partners within the OAS. Uh, we can't, uh, we can't impose we can, as you said, it is a platform, it is a forum. It is the only place where the Latin Americans can attract our attention 
exclusively. And there's not a great disposition in Washington to use the OAS for that purpose. We generally want it as a means for getting something of interest to the United States accepted by Latin America. And I wondered if that attitude has changed. That was excellent. Better said, right? But I have to be careful, because if I address some of the part of the question, it could be politically problematic. <laughs> um, but, but yes, the, the, remember, the OAS is a consensus-based organization. Everyone has one vote. There is no Security Council like the United Nations, right? Where the United States is one among five that has, you know, real. I, I have one vote. I am one of 34, 33, right? And we do everything by consensus. Sometimes we try to do things by acclamation, right? As we've done with recent declarations about the situation in, uh, in Peru. Uh, but you're, you're right. I, I, I think things have changed a little bit from more for what you explained. I think, I think the United, the, the, a lot of uh, member states are still looking for U.S. leadership. Yeah. They understand the value of U.S. leadership. We have to show leadership. We can't be at the tip of the spear all the time, right? Because that, but we have to, we have to show leadership on, on some issues. And we have to listen. And we have to listen. And, and I do a lot of listening because you, you remember those permanent council meetings. They can go on for a while. <laughs> right? And I'm there. I make a point of staying there. Some of my colleagues leave, but no, I'm still there. Because it's important for folks to see that the American ambassador is engaged, cares, is listening, is, is talking, right? And I go to every meeting, and some of the people in my staff, Andrew is here somewhere, right? Uh, is wondering, why do you go to all these meetings? Uh, we, we, well, because it's important for them to see that we care about these meetings. And that regardless of the, of the topic, it just doesn't have to be uh, on the issue of Haiti. And yes, we have to listen. And, and we, have no other, we have no choice but to listen because member states will take you know, the, the mic and will go on and express their views and we will listen. But the listening doesn't go on in the permanent council. The listening goes on the margins of the permanent council. When I go individually to member states and have a conversation right about explain this to me what is it what is it that you what's in your interest what is you know how do we get to yes on this issue right so there's a lot of diplomacy and conversation that goes out on outside of of the permanent council and that yes you're right i'm always asking questions and listening never with very few occasions saying we need to we need to go we need to go through this so uh yes and remember the caribbean makes has 14 member states uh, that's uh, about, what, 40? A little over 40% of the members. And when they vote in bloc, and they often do as CARICOM, that's, right? And remember, uh, uh, every single one of these Caribbean island states have as much voice and vote that I do as the U.S. ambassador, right? And so they, and they take advantage of that. And so we need to work with the Caribbean, right? if we're going to address some of these issues because they represent 14 votes out of the 30 some odd votes there, right? But thank you for that question, great question. Uh, Ambassador Moore, it's great to have you with us, thanks so much. So one uh, a point of clarification and then a, a tough question. Uh, on the budget issue, you mentioned uh, I think 84 million. Uh, this, this year. Yeah, uh, which is the core budget. But in addition to that, there are lots of trust funds and special funds, which uh, last time I looked at least, uh, exceeded by a significant margin that core budget. No, not quite. So, okay, well, maybe you could give us some of the yeah, numbers. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the point of clarification. Uh, and then the second, uh, you mentioned um, the working group on Haiti. Uh, you talked about a possible multinational police force. Correct. Now, I realize this is a sensitive issue, uh, but I wonder if you could give us some sense of, have any countries, including the U.S., uh, express their willingness to put their own uh, boots on the ground? Because uh, last I heard, the Canadians said no for themselves, for example. They would provide ships or something, but I, nor have I heard the U.S. offer. So, and this issue's been kicked around now for quite a while, Correct. and sort of nothing. So 
whatever you can tell us about the current state of this idea of a possible police force, uh, be very interested. So thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So on the on the budget, yes, right. You're absolutely right. The the, the regular budget, which is the eighty four million dollars, is not the only money that comes in. There's what they call voluntary contributions. So for example, we provide five million dollars to the Inter American Commission on on Human Rights every year. Uh, we provide. We're not providing any money on development, so no voluntary contributions. Um, and we provide uh, on the electoral observation missions, we provide significant numbers. So we provide a good amount on the democracy portfolio of the, we provide the bulk of the voluntary contributions. Now there are other states, some uh, permanent observers actually that provide some funds for specific narrow projects. Now I don't know the number, Richard, as to how many of those voluntary contributions come, uh, but, but you're right, it's an important support fund for specific projects, but the salaries and the functioning of the OS comes from the, from the regular budget. Now to your second question. You're right, we have been talking about this at the United Nations, we're talking about this at the OAS, about a multinational police force with, to deal with the sort of dire, grave security situation. I mean, we can talk stories about the, the, the gangs controlling basically 50% of Port-au-Prince, not allowing food to, to move uh, around the city, kidnappings, it, it's, it's, and it's deteriorating and getting worse, actually. Um, and so we're, with Canada and others, trying to uh, find a framework and actual capabilities to provide and build a multinational police force that we would support. Um, not going to say how we were going to support that right now, but um, the Canadians, I think, are still interested in supporting. We're just talking about how that looks like exactly, right, in a tangible way, and there's still no consensus. The working group has established a platform where states have are decided to, are going to put up into this platform what they're willing to contribute. So, for example, Jamaica has already said that they're willing to provide police. Uh, the Bahamas has indicated the same. Uh, El Salvador indicated that it was willing to provide troops, but then retracted. Uh, there are a few member states that are willing to put on the humanitarian social side some resources. So we're collecting that information at the OAS and putting out a sort of um, a dashboard, if you will, with states indicating what they're willing to provide. And we're, we want to get that done, Richard, by the end of the month, right? In all areas, not just security. Uh, but you're right, this has been a bit of a challenge to get people to commit, um, not so much politically, but resources to the idea of a multinational force. But we, and by we I mean the United States, are going to insist and we're going to keep at it and finding creative ways to address this issue because that's not sustainable. I think, you know, Haiti is part of our hemisphere, it's in the Caribbean, it is a, an issue for the Dominican Republic. Uh, and the issue of migration, as you know, and so we can't just let it just sit. And in fact, the Haitian government is insisting on a probably a more robust force than just a police force. But um, the key here is political will and commitment, and we're not quite there yet, but we haven't given up, and we're still talking about that at different forums. Thank you, Ambassador Mora. On behalf of the Institute, I want to thank you again for your remarks and for coming out to San Diego. I want to thank all of you for participating in, in this um, event. Thank you.